First, you're all very, very welcome. Um, my name's Jane Olmeyer, and I'm the director of the Trinity Ballroom Hub. Um, and it's always a great pleasure to be able to welcome people to the building, especially at 9 o'clock or 9.15 uh, in the morning. It's usually not quite so busy. Today's a very special uh, event for us, and it's nothing to do with what's happening over there. Um, our royalty is in the room. just to uh, say a few words about what it is that we do in the Trinity Long Room Hub because I'm looking out here there's a lot of new faces um, so for those of you who are coming for the first time you're extremely welcome I hope it won't be the last but we're a research institute uh, in the arts and the humanities and uh, we really do three things in this building the first thing we do is we celebrate the excellence of the arts and humanities at Trinity, and that's an excellence that goes right back to the 17th century, actually, and continues uh, uh, to the present. The second thing that we do is we promote conversations in and across disciplines. So we're all about multi and interdisciplinarity, because the magic really happens when the disciplines collide. And I think we're going to get a really strong sense of that uh, uh, this morning from, from Genevieve. Um, the third thing we do is public humanities, and the public humanities ranges on the one hand from our window. I don't know how many of you walk past this building every day, but the window changes every couple of months. We try to have provocative quotes up there. Um, uh, uh, so 20,000 people will walk by the window, you hope that they're looking at the quotes, they find them provocative and stimulating. But we also run about 300 events in this building um, that are very much aimed at just anybody who'd like to attend, um, both academic and uh, uh, non-academic uh, audiences uh, as part of our public humanities programme. And this lecture series that we're kicking off today is called What Does It Mean to be Human in the 21st Century? Um, and it's a series that actually will run in the coming academic year with a whole series of amazing speakers uh, who uh, will be reflecting on what it does mean to be human uh, in the 21st century. And we thought, no better way to kick this series off than with Genevieve Bell. So um, it's with real pleasure uh, that uh, uh, we welcome you, Genevieve. It's great you've come. I know you've come a very long way. Um, and I would just say, as, as a housekeeping, um, there are loos back here. Uh, uh, obviously, if an alarm goes, please leave the building. But there will be a certain amount of activity out in front square. Let's just pretend it's not happening. Um, but you're probably aware that the Duke and Duchess of Sussex are coming to uh, visit uh, the Book of Kells. And I think there's a bit of a walkabout. So there is a, a lot of security. And you may well see snipers uh, uh, on that. <laughs> and actually, I'm not joking, so don't be alarmed. <laughs> if you see men with rifles uh, uh, on top of the... Th 15, I mean, at the top of the library uh, 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 next to us. Um, uh, but, but anyway, it's, it's in no way going to interfere with our enjoyment this morning. So uh, let's uh, give Leonard Hobbs a, a very warm welcome, and he now is going to introduce uh, Genevieve. Leonard. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jane. Um, so um, as Jane mentioned, my name is Leonard Hobbs. I'm Director of Research and Innovation here at the Trinity College. Um, 160 years ago uh, this year, uh, the great-great-grandmother of the prince who's going to be here today sent the very first message, transatlantic message, uh, from, from, which went from Valencia and County Kerry all the way to Hearts Content and on to New York. And she wrote um, that, the, uh, that she was convinced that the presence would join her in fervently hoping that the electric cable would prove an additional link between the two places whose friendship is founded upon their common interests and, and reciprocal esteem. Very grand. And in, 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 in a language um, uncustomary to American presidents today, uh, <laughs> President Buchanan responded uh, saying that an instrument designed by divine providence uh, would diffuse religion, civilization, liberty and, and, and uh, law throughout the world. So it was the start of something amazing. Um, it was the start of, of, of a communications technology um, of, of an entire way of life that, that today uh, we live in a world where we're connected instantaneously, um, where machines are starting to think for themselves, making decisions for us, where data has become the new oil, 
um, and where where the largest the, the world's largest companies are now based on on your data as opposed to capital assets. So it's an extraordinary time we live in, and and because of that, we're really excited about this lecture series now that that James described, and in particular, we're delighted to have here with us today uh, an ex colleague of mine, um, Genevieve Bell, who I've been admiring for many years. Um, and um, at, at Genevieve um, worked for, um, and still is, is still connected with a, a company, Intel Corporation, um, that, that is probably the company that is responsible um, uh, for enabling the availability of this vast amount of data uh, through, through the technology that they have um, invent, continue to invent. Um, Genevieve spent 15 years at Intel and um, rose to the ranks of Vice President. Um, and, um, and, and also became the first female um, um, fellow, senior fellow at the company, which is quite, quite, quite an accolade. Um, and uh, all that from, from being uh, not, uh, not actually even starting out as a process engineer, which most people do in the company, but she's, a, she's an anthropologist, technologist, and futurist. So quite, quite a, a collection of skills. And today she's a director of a new, of a new um, institute at uh, the um, Australian National University. Uh, called A3, it's looking at autonomy, agency, and insurance, and it's looking at the study of AI and its impact and the impact in general of technology on, on humanity. So absolutely perfect and ideal, and we're delighted to have such an expert with us today. So without further ado, thank you. Well, it's my pleasure to be here, snipers on the roof notwithstanding. Um, I did have a brief moment this morning of wondering if you'd actually finally worked out how dangerous a woman with ideas was. <laughs> and with the notion of that much security. Oh, wait, but royalty, not me. <laughs> so, as I said, it's my incredible privilege and pleasure to be here. Uh, Leonard and I have known each other for a long time. I met him the first time I came to Ireland, nearly 15 years ago, as it turns out. Um, and as an Australian girl, I clearly have all kinds of connections to Ireland. My colouring and complexion would give that away yeah. as my, my turn of phrase. And I have to say, the first time I came here, it was another one of those moments that felt a little bit like coming home. So it's my pleasure to get to be here again. And it's my pleasure to kick off a new lecture series. I can't help but think the notion of what it means to be human in the 21st century is one of the critical questions we have to answer not just in the humanities, but frankly across all the disciplines. So I think it's a question that should echo through the humanities, the social sciences, the sciences and engineering too, as it is in some ways what it is we have to think about in universities and beyond. So I call this talk Managing the Machines. I mean that a little bit tongue-in-cheek. I'm not sure that the notion of managing machinery is in fact the place we want to go, but it is often the place that we are put as humans in that conversation, is that our job is somehow to manage the technology I want to unpack that idea a little bit and give it a couple of different contexts. I want to give it a historical context and I want to give it, in some ways, a critical field context. So how we have managed the machines over the last 250 years and what it might mean to contemplate managing them now. In order to do all of that, though, I need to start with a little bit of a history of who I am and where I came from. So Leonard is right to introduce me as someone with a complicated biography. That is indeed true. Uh, I am many things. First and foremost, I'm an anthropologist. I'm also the daughter of an anthropologist. So I grew up on my mother's field sites in central and northern Australia in the 1970s and 1980s. I spent my childhood with indigenous people who remembered their country before white fellas and fences and cattle, not always in that order, and who during my childhood were incredibly willing to take my little brother and I onto their country and to tell the stories of a place that they had been occupying at that point for somewhere between 10 to 20,000 years. And so my childhood was a childhood of speaking Walpuri and Kaidich, a little bit of Waramunga and Alyara, which were the languages of the area. I learned to hunt and gather. This means I killed things continuously and ate them. I hasten to add before you think I might be a burgeoning psychopath. <laughs> <laughs> I wore no shoes uh, and I didn't have to go to school terribly often. It was basically best childhood ever. <laughs> uh, and it's an incredibly long way from there to Silicon Valley where I've spent the last 20 years. And the reality is I got there like I think many people from our shared cultural experiences do. I ran away from home. And I ran away from Australia to America, a journey that in some ways ought to also be familiar. Uh, I took myself first to Bryn Mawr College in Philadelphia and then to Stanford. I did my PhD at Stanford again in anthropology. Um, my studies at that point had to do with native people. So my doctoral work was with Native Americans and boarding schools and education, and I spent a year hanging around in a national archives looking at records, and it was blissful. 
and how you get from being, and Leonard is looking at me going, wait, you didn't what? And so how you get from being a Native American ethno-historian with uh, expertise in feminist and critical theory to Intel is another story which should make desperate sense here of all places, which is to say, I met a man in a bar. <laughs> means I'm never good for career advice. <laughs> but I met a man at a bar in Palo Alto in 1998 uh, when I was on the faculty at Stanford and he changed my life. Not in the usual ways, but he changed my life because he asked me one incredibly simple question, although possibly not a good question for a bar, but he asked me what I did. And I said I was an anthropologist. He said, what's that? I said, I studied people. He asked why. I should have guessed he was an engineer at that point. <laughs> I kind of let it roll because I didn't know any better. Um, and I said that because they were interesting. He asked what I did with that. I said I was a professor. And he said, couldn't you do more? And I thought, yes, I could stop talking to you. <laughs> and so I did. And I didn't think anything more of it, which makes it all the more startling when he called me the next day at my house. Because we're talking 1998. And I knew better than to give my number to strange men in bars, because that's never a good idea. And he found me anyway. And let's remember, this is 1998, so we're talking before Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn and Tinder and even Google. These days, if you type red-headed Australian anthropologist into Google, I am the very first thing that comes up. <laughs> so I'd like to say I have worked out how to game the algorithm in 20 years, but 20 years ago, the way Bob found me was he called every anthropology department in the Bay Area looking for a red-headed Australian. <laughs> <laughs> and Stanford said, do you mean Genevieve and would you like her home phone <laughs> <laughs> Which may not have been my finest moment, but turned out to be the moment that changed my life, so I've worked on being grateful ever since. <laughs> and so Bob called me and said the magic words for those of you for whom these words still work, uh, I am with you. He said, I'll buy you lunch. <laughs> and I realized that whilst I had finished my PhD, I would still do almost anything for the prospect of free food. <laughs> and Bob introduced me to his colleagues, his colleagues in turn introduced me to their colleagues, and one thing led to another in the way it only could in Silicon Valley in 1998. And I met a team of social science researchers at Intel. And they were looking for an anthropologist because they were psychologists. And it turns out they had been hired as social scientists because the engineers didn't know the difference between a psychologist and an anthropologist. <laughs> so sweet. Um, but had come to realize that possibly this wasn't the only answer to doing social sciences <laughs> and had gone looking for an anthropologist and had found me. Uh, it was a long recruit process because frankly, I didn't want a job in industry. I liked being an academic. I liked what I was doing and I couldn't work out why I would join Intel. And Intel didn't do a very good job of pitching itself, I have to say. But at some point in what was an eight-month courtship, I realized that I was being offered more than a job, I was being offered an opportunity to do something at scale that my discipline rarely is. Which is that all those years ago, in 1998, Intel was building the future. It was in the middle of a technological revolution that was shaping everything. And it was a company entirely staffed by engineers who didn't think that people mattered. And I came from a discipline that cares about nothing if it doesn't care about people, and putting people in the beginning and the middle of every conversation. And so I realized that there was an opportunity that I hadn't really calculated. ANU, well, at that point Stanford, was a safe bet. If I was good and I crossed all my I's and dotted all my T's and didn't really screw it up too badly, I might get tenure there. I didn't know what I would do with Intel. It made no sense to me. I didn't understand it. But I also knew that the opportunity to be a social scientist in the middle of a company that was building technology for the future was an opportunity to have impact at a scale, if I got it right, that you couldn't possibly do as an academic. <coughs> and so I left the tenure track job at Stanford to join Intel. On my first day of the job, my new boss sat me down, told me she was incredibly excited I was there. I didn't realize how lucky I was that my first boss was a she. She was the last one I ever had um, of that gender. But she sat me down and said, we're very excited that you're here. We need your help with two things. And I thought to myself, for six months, there hasn't been a job description. And now my job is two things. I would like them to be good things. And so in my notebook, because we were still in paper in those days, I wrote the numbers one and two. And I said, OK, what are they? And my new boss says, well, we have a problem with women. 
<laughs> and I'm like, yeah, you don't have any. <laughs> like, but I'm sure that's not the problem. She just looked at me and was like, okay, so not the problem. I was like, okay, which women? Because again, trained social scientist, good to empirically question questions. And she says, well, all women. And I'm like, what, all 3.2 billion of them? She went, yep. I said, okay, what do you want me to do about 3.2 billion women? And she paused, took a deep breath, and said, it would be great if you could tell us what they want. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I thought, uh-oh. But I wrote down in the notebook, women all, and underlined it. <laughs> and fell into the kind of research reverie you can, where you think, what is the project I'm going to do to explain why women all is not a meaningful category, and also something that says something about women to a semiconductor manufacturing company? And I'm sure I was off in that little, like, Wonderland when I realized this boss had said there were two things. And if thing number one is women, all, it is just a little scary to contemplate what she imagines thing number two might be. I think I secretly hoped it would be men, because they like <laughs> The sum of all humanity could be mine. But no, this new boss said, here at Intel, and I always have to caveat this, this was 1998. She says, here at Intel, we have an ROW problem. And I'm like, uh oh. I don't know what that stands for. So I don't even know what the problem is because I don't know what the acronym is. And so I cheerfully say, so what's ROW? And she says, rest of world. <laughs> <laughs> and I pause for a moment because I know really what the answer is here, but I, you know, you should always ask the next question as an anthropologist. And so I cheerfully say, where's world? Such that you have a rest of world. And she looks at me as though I'm obviously stupid and she is regretting her decision in hiring me and says, well, world is America and everything else is rest of world. <laughs> and we have a problem with it. And we're so excited that you're here because you come from there. <laughs> At which point I thought, oh, this might have been a colossal mistake. <laughs> Alternately, I may have job security basically for eternity because if your job description is explain women and everyone who doesn't live in America, <laughs> It's interesting to think about two things at that point. Who are you explaining all of that to? And why don't they know? And then you realize that your job is to talk about everyone who isn't in the building to everyone who is. And that is simultaneously a good punchline to a story, but also a tremendous responsibility and a little bit terrifying to think about what it meant that that was a worldview that pervaded Silicon Valley. And I think under many other circumstances, I might have thought maybe I should just go back to the university because it was safer. But I'm a good Australian girl, and I thought, well, there's a challenge. How do we stop them ever saying rest of world again anywhere near me? <laughs> I'm happy to say they don't. <laughs> that they still think I come from somewhere else, which is best. <laughs> so I spent 18 years at Intel uh, helping bring ethnography, research social science, design, design thinking, human-computer interaction, ubiquitous computing, you name that bundle of things, but basically bringing those perspectives into a tech company. And that was an incredible gig. And then about two years ago, the Vice Chancellor of the Australian National University, which is Australia's only national university, came to me and asked me if I'd consider coming home. And I said no, because <laughs> it didn't seem particularly compelling, because he said, could you just be a professor? And I thought, no, I actually kind of like the gig I've got. Being a professor didn't feel like a good adventure at that point. And he came back to me and made a different offer, which he said, listen, the Australian National University, like many universities around the world, is at a moment of time when what it means to think about education is coming under tremendous pressure. Pressure from the market, pressure from our stakeholders, pressure from our students, pressure from what it means to think about what an educational mission should be. And what it means to think about evolving those institutions can't just be looking for more from within. And he said, so I'm looking to bring some people into the university to act as adjutants, basically. I think he thought I was an irritant. <laughs> He's American. I'm going to imagine he meant it nicely. Um, and his argument was, I need people who don't have traditional academic careers to ask the questions that we've forgotten how to ask inside the university. And that seemed like a more interesting proposition. He coupled it with the idea that what you also might need for those people is a space where they can continue to be a little bit like they've been outside the university. And so he created the Innovation Institutes, of which I have the first. The idea being, could we create a space in which you could build new knowledge, experiment with new, man new relationships between universities and others, and experiment with ways of transmitting knowledge that move beyond just another degree program. 
And he said, okay, how does that sound? And I went, that sounds terrifying, but I still don't know what the Institute would do. And it took me a little while to work that out, and I came back to him and I said, listen, I think I know what the Institute needs to do, and that's the piece I want to tell you about. So, in order to make sense of that, you have to see this one horrible chart. So, this graph, oh, it's a great, <laughs> great straw person graph, was published by the World Economic Forum in 2016 in their usual talk fest in January. And when Schwab published this in 2016, he said, the world is entering into the fourth wave of the Industrial Revolution. You can call it Industry 4.0, you can call it the fourth mm -hmm. wave of the Industrial Revolution, you can call it a lot of things, but according to Schwab and many others since then, we were standing at a moment in time where what it meant to think about technological infrastructures was changing. Now, for those of us who come out of the social sciences and humanities, this is an excellent chart because of the work it does in tidying up history. <laughs> it makes it all look remarkably stable and linear and like in order and underneath of this sit lovely dates which only work in particular places. <laughs> so, you know, first wave, we know this one, this is basically mechanization, the steam engine, he says 1700s to mid 1800s. Second wave, of course, mass production, assembly lines, electricity, late 1800s to mid 1900s. Automation and computing, starting in the 50s, proceeding forward. Fourth wave of the Industrial Revolution, cyber-physical systems. Here you should think about, the best way I can think about this at the moment is Internet of Things turbocharged by artificial intelligence is what he really means by cyber-physical systems. So think of this also as the age of AI. Now, of course, that time scheme works really well if you're in the West. It doesn't hold if you're in China or India or Latin America or Africa, where most of those things happened in the 20th century and many of them since 1945. It doesn't help if what you want to think about was what else was going on, because each one of those technological transformations is also about profound shifts in cultural practice, social structure, social organizations, mm -hmm. profoundly different ideas about citizenship, governance, regulation, ideas of civil and civic society are all under pressure. Of course, it doesn't say anything about the fact that all of these were resisted in different kinds of ways and created both their own centers of gravity but their own backlashes. And it also, in some really complicated way, suggests that each wave erased the one that went before it. And of course, the reality is that didn't happen either. They're cumulative, not sequential. It also misses, for me, one of the most important things, which is, okay, so all this technology came along. What did all the major institutions in the world do as it happened? How were those technologies harnessed and controlled, or in my language, managed? And what might we learn from the first three waves to help us inform the fourth one and to think about what it was that I wanted to do at the ANU? So let's just pick that first one, right? So steam engines, first steam engine. So of course, New Cummins atmospheric engine turns up on top of a mine in Cornwall in 1817, 18, 18 thereabouts. Doesn't become at scale until he and Watt engage in pretty significant IP wars all the way through the 1700s, where they move from being in, well, mines to factories and ultimately into trains in the 1800s. But at the same time, that machinery creates this really interesting question about who's going to manage it. What it meant to build a steam engine was one thing. The first men who built steam engines were mostly blacksmiths and ironmongers. They knew how to think about metal. They knew how to think about heat. They knew how to play with form. They were readers, so they were reading the science of vacuums and water management. But all they knew how to do was build engines. They didn't know how to think about building what would come on top of engines or the consequences of those engines in terms of what it meant for safety and scale and machinery and the spaces in which those machines would need to be housed. <coughs> Newcomen's first atmospheric engine required a two-story high brick house and a wood truss system that was fairly hard to reproduce because it was big and heavy and loud and noisy. And it turns out Newcomen was terrible at making a house that went around the engine. It required different thinking. But ultimately, the start of people managing this form of machinery comes much later than the machinery itself. So if the 1700s are all about building engines at scale, the first time we have people who are in some ways trained to think about the engines isn't until the end of the 1700s. And paradoxically, in some ways, the very first school of engineering actually starts in France. It's the Ecole Polytechnique in 1794. And it starts effectively within six months of killing the king of France. Uh, it's in the middle of the French Revolution. 
Now, I don't want to say you need to kill a king in order to get to a system of managing machines, but in this particular instance, it helped. I'm also acutely aware there are snipers on the roof, as I say that. So let's imagine I'm not suggesting revolution. What I am suggesting, however, though, is one of the really interesting consequences of the French Revolution from the perspective of the disciplines that we now carry forward is that in killing the king and decentering the priesthood, what ended up happening was France found itself with no one who had authority and no one who could manage what was an increasingly elaborate system of roads and machinery. And that up until then it had been controlled by the priesthood who saw it as a mechanism for extracting resources, not as a way of building the nation. And so suddenly you have an entire system that needs to be continued at scale, that needs no longer to be configured around monasteries and centers of priestly power, but needs to find a way out of the blood and into the science. And so the Ecole Polytechnique is created by the men who bookended the French Revolution, by the, you know, effectively during the most troubled period of time. There was a moment in Paris where they assembled all the hard scientists, the mathematicians, the logicians, the philosophers, the natural scientists, and said to them, we need to find a way out, and that way out has to be through our intellects, not through our positionality and through our power that came through our birth. It has to be through our minds. And they created a form of education that was novel at the time, but hardly new, which was the idea of combining theory and praxis. So the idea that you should theorize, but also build. So in addition to learning the natural sciences, there was also a little bit of surveying. <laughs> There was a nice bit of cartography. There was some learning to write and penmanship. There were ideas about accounting and speech giving. Because what they were building here wasn't engineers in the classic sense, but technocrats. And so the Ecole Polytechnique is the first school of engineering. It is, of course, not the last. The next set turn up in, well, Switzerland, and then in the US. So ironically, although the Americans would hate to hear that probably this week, um, but the Ecole Polytechnique is what inspires West Point's Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, the Army Corps of Engineers being the first place that engineering turns up in the US, blending both civil and military engineering, and all the instructors were raised at the Ecole Polytechnique. Probably wouldn't tell them that today, but nonetheless. What's interesting here is that that notion of an education that blended science and hands-on practical learning is what spreads out from Paris. It spreads into America. It spreads to Australia. It interestingly doesn't take root in the UK until the 20th century as the first schools of engineering because in the UK, the notions of this got tied up with the men who ran the companies that built the tools. So Smeaton, Maudsley, Brunel, you became a Smeaton boy or a Maudsley boy or a Brunel boy. You were trained, apprenticed in those companies. The British way of dealing with this was that by 1824 they had created the Society for Civil Engineers and it was a way of certifying engineers across those companies so that you could work between them and creating the notion that in order to be an engineer you needed to be certified because the arc of your work was actually about safety at scale. It wasn't just about systems but it was about safety. And of course engineering continues to spread globally, it has different touch points as I said, Australia is actually quite early, 1850s and 1860s. It's tied up around mining. In the US, it's actually tied up around the spread of the railway and when it moves from being military engineering to civil engineering, so it gets out of the arc of the way armies move and becomes part of other things. Uh, just for fun, the second school of engineering in the world, however, actually turns out to be in Istanbul, though Constantinople at the time, and it was the Suleiman School of Naval Engineering understood for the same reasons again as they had in Paris, of how to create effectively a technocratic class. So that first set of machines demanded institutional responses, right? It demanded responses from universities of how did we in some ways contain, exploit and scale this stuff. It demanded responses from governments because governments needed engineers in order to make the systems work, in order to find ways of making it safe for citizens. <coughs> And it created whole new ways of thinking. And of course the word engineering, which really actually doesn't appear until much later, and is not in fact about engineers, but about ingenuity. So just in case you think that's what it really was about, it wasn't. Next one. So, same thing, remember? That second wave in Schwab's thing talks about <coughs> mass production, the assembly line, and electrification. The second order effect of all of those is actually to create a new idea about money. We go from money in some ways to capitalism. 
those technologies allow companies to get created that didn't look anything like the first wave of companies that appeared in the 1800s and the 1900s. What you instead get is a completely different notion of how money could get made. You had the creation of companies that had shares, you saw stock, you had people who traded in company futures, you had people who owned pieces of companies and not others. And that happens all the way through the back end of the 1800s and by 1880, uh, Philadelphia capitalist basically, an industrialist, went to the president of the University of Pennsylvania and said, I'll give you $100,000 if you make me a better bookkeeper. Now the president of the University of Pennsylvania was a smart man and said, you don't need a better bookkeeper, but I'll take you $100,000. <laughs> because of course that's between one to three million US at this point in time, so not nothing. And he says, I will take that money because I should think the problem that you're talking about isn't about bookkeeping. It's about different notions of what it means to have money at scale. And so he assembled a bunch of smart thinkers in the university, economists, the beginning of behavioral psychology, lawyers, some mathematicians, and they said, what would it take to find a way to manage that money? And by 1881, the Wharton School of Business is started. By the early 1900s, that particular school of business had created a series of tools we still use today, including the measure of the economy as being the GDP, was invented at that school. The first ways of thinking about how do you uh, imagine and theorize the power of brands and manage them. First branding <coughs> theories went on there. First notions, problematic as they are as a child raised in a country that has labor unions, but the first way of negotiating between labor and management in a non-favorable way to labor <laughs> was also imagined here. So Wharton creates businessmen. That's the thing it creates, right? At the request of industry. Second and third schools of business go on, of course, to be at Harvard and Berkeley. They are also responses to industrialists asking for ways of thinking differently. And again, much like engineering, this is a new, I wouldn't want to call it discipline necessarily, it's certainly a new applied science. It starts out incredibly broad in terms of the ideas it draws on. It rapidly narrows to a very clear set of theoretical tools and an idea about practice, and then it scales very, very quickly. Though again, very, very globally. Australia doesn't get its first school of business until the 1950s. It's quite late in the UK too. This is a US thing first and foremost, which makes sense when we think about how it is that capital and capitalism have unfolded, that it would start there as hardly a surprise. So you can guess where this is leading us, because da, 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 computers. This is actually the second in the world stored memory computer, happily from my hometown in Australia. After the ENIAC, there was CIDRAC. That's CIDRAC. First digital music, among other things. But also ushers in the beginning of a whole new way of thinking about computation, right? So computers from 1946 until 19, mid-1960s were really just about faster calculators. They were just about numbers. But by the mid-1960s, computers, particularly from IBM and Honeywell and General Electric, had started to find their way into many governments and government departments, particularly in the US, but also in the UK and Europe. They were being used for everything from payrolls to scientific calculations, to managing the books, to managing inventory, and to managing weaponry. And in 1966, there was an audit done of government departments, and the relevant department in the United States looked around and found themselves in an interesting and awkward position, which was that the government had a software problem, but they didn't know how to call it that. All of the American government ran on two computers. IBM's, where the proprietary software was Fortran, created in 1956. Still around today. <laughs> if you play with metal, you know what Fortran is. People still program in it, astonishingly enough. But IBM had Fortran, and Honeywell and General Electric had something known as COBOL by the 60s, but had been flowmatic in the 50s, invented, of course, by the lovely Grace Hopper. Yay, women in computing. That's my shout out to them all right there. So. The American government looks around and says, oh crap, our entire government runs on two companies, two pieces of proprietal software. No one is allowed to know that software unless they work for those companies, and if we want those machines to do anything, we have to employ those companies to do it. And that looked like a kind of vulnerability that in the 1960s seemed faintly problematic. And so the United States government went to Stanford and went to a man named George, George Forsyth in the Department of Mathematics at Stanford University, and they said, George, 
Do you think it would be possible to imagine creating an abstract language for computers that was neither Fortran nor COBOL that would let us talk to all machines, not just IBMs and Honeywells? Could you create a layer of abstraction? <coughs> and George goes, yeah, maybe. <laughs> and spends two years trying to work out a fast trip. And he gets together a whole bunch of buddies of his from Purdue, University of Indiana, a few other places around the traps, and for two years they send each other happy envelopes full of bits of paper, because of course we're talking before the internet. And the bits of paper are themselves quite splendid, and they have an entire correspondence. And the correspondence is basically, could we create a language for computing that isn't Fortran or COBOL? And in so doing, what they actually ended up inadvertently creating is of course computer science. Because what they worked out to do was how do you train people not to work at IBM <laughs> or Honeywell or GE, but to work for the government, which meant you should be able to do all of that stuff and then some other stuff that didn't in invent it yet. And then in a methodology that, as a social scientist, boggles my mind, and I'm willing to bet for everyone in the room who is trained in the social sciences and humanities, you are going to have a moment when I tell you this. But in December 1968, at the Association for Computer Machinery in San Francisco, George and his buddies rocked up with a whole series of, I imagine, Romeo paper, because we're talking pre-photocopiers, so the nice purple smelly ink stuff. Mimeogram? Yeah, those ones. With a whole pile of those, gathered all the people at this conference who were basically people who worked with computers. They weren't yet computer scientists, but they were people who used computers in their jobs or worked with computers. And he said, we've developed a curriculum for computer science. Here it is. It's 10 pages long. Please go home to your various institutions and teach it. And everyone went, that's great, and did. <laughs> now, if you come from the social sciences, the notion that someone could come to your national conference, hand out a curriculum for your discipline, and everyone would go home happily and teach it at their home institutions <laughs> is unthinkable. In computer science, this continues to happen to this day. This <laughs> curriculum is updated globally, redistributed, and everyone teaches some version of it because it is standardized. Yeah, I mostly just look at this with a kind of wonderment and amazement at how you could just have a discipline and then send it around. And of course, you know, at that point, computer scientists were mostly reformed mathematicians, linguists, philosophers, and logicians. These days, of course, we know it to be something else. Three completely different applied sciences, emergent from three completely different technical regimes with different impulses. Governmental, industry, a different form of government, completely different roles that universities played in all of them, though they do have some commonalities, which gets me to what I said to my vice chancellor, which was I said, okay, if Schwab is right, even if he's wrong about the time scale, but if he's right, and we are at the precipice of that next wave of technology, what manages it? It's not computer science. Despite all of the calls for adding ethics to computer science, I don't think that solves this problem, though I think adding ethics to computer science would be excellent. It's not about putting design thinking into engineering, although see above, I think that would be excellent too. My sense is that these systems, these notions of IoT turbocharged by artificial intelligence, the notion of physical objects with a digital inset, of a digital that is no longer like it has been, of a computer that doesn't have pre-written rules, that is somehow actually moving without reference to traditional software, that would be a different thing. And we've already seen versions of this around us. This is all of the experiments with autonomous vehicles. This is the smart lift system that at some point you will encounter with mild horror when you go to a building tall enough and there is a button set that directs you to an elevator carriage in which there are no buttons because some system is operating the entire lift infrastructure without you. Those things are already around us, but how do we think about building them scaling them, and doing it securely. And so I, in a moment of Silicon Valley hubris, said to my vice chancellor, to do this requires a new applied science. It actually requires going back and having a bit of a think about what it would do to do this. This is the same moment that got us engineering and business and computer science. It's nothing more, nothing less than that. And so I said to him, that's what I want to do. And he went, that's nice. <laughs> I have to call him back and go, you know what I've just said? He said, well, it's a bit ambitious, but you know, you can probably do it. All right. And so I came back to Australia with the sole goal of starting a new applied science, which is what the Institute is about. We're building something new, and something new is a new applied science. I don't know what it's called. 
The only comfort I have in not knowing what it's called is that none of those other names emerged until later. The reason the Institute is called Autonomy, Agency and Assurance was those were the first three questions I could think of. <laughs> and A seemed good. <laughs> but basically, the Institute I'm heading up has the notion of building a new applied science at its core. It has three strategic imperatives that sit under that. Working out what that body of knowledge is, or at least what its principles are. Finding a bunch of people who are going to care as passionately as I seem to. And finding ways that, to transmit it that look beyond just another degree program. So we're nine months in as an institute. I have 10 people working for me. We've done a few things and I want to share those with you. One is I think we've worked out at least what the guiding principles of this new applied science are. I think one of the delights about doing something in the 21st century is you no longer need to think it's prescriptive. I think one of the nice things about knowing that the questions matter more than the answers is framing the questions turns out to be the important piece. And were I to think that there were a north star for this applied science, it would simply be that you have to move from problem solving to question asking. And that I actually think that's the hardest job of all, is knowing how to ask good questions. And as we talk about these entire systems, knowing how to ask the questions about them before we build them and then go, uh-oh, seems like a good idea. So for us, it's about how do we ask those questions. We've taken a first stab at what we think the first five questions are. We're in the process of conducting a six-month piece of multi-sided qualitative field work, looking at places that are already starting to build systems and the kind of questions they have, either building them literally, building them through government tenders, building them through regulating things that don't exist yet. Imagine building is a complicated term there. And then, because it is a university and I like to break the rules just a little bit, we're actually going to stand up a degree program next year as a prototype. So. Starting in February, I'm going to take 10 students, and we're going to actually build a curriculum in real time, which is a bit naughty. Um, I have the beginnings of a reading list. That at least helps. <laughs> and we're going to test what works and what doesn't. So that's a big wind up to say, well, what are the five questions? And I think they're these. <coughs> First question is the question of autonomy. If we say these systems are powered by artificial intelligence, or at least the technologies that are currently artificial intelligence, bearing in mind that I think that's a deeply unstable term. But if we imagine sitting underneath AI, there are a series of interesting pieces of technical system, algorithms, notions about data, new techniques about learning. They create the possibility of systems that don't need reference to pre-written rules. The first way people have thought about these cyber-physical systems is to call them autonomous. Now, of course, one of the problems with that is autonomy is a word that is deeply freighted. If you're a philosopher, you think you own this word and you would like to be balling with me out there in the quad. Um, because that's what every philosopher has done every time I have said autonomy. They're like, you don't know what you're talking about. I'm like, don't be good, a disciplinary word then. So autonomy is clearly a word that has a history in philosophy that extends back 2,000 years. It is also a word that has a socio-technical imagination that is not uncomplicated. Every time you say autonomy in English, the semantic slippage from there to consciousness, sentience, self-awareness and self is hard to resist. Yet they aren't the same words and they have different histories and different intents and different <coughs> meanings. It's also the case that autonomy sits again in the West inside a very particular imagination that starts with the golem, goes live with Frankenstein and ends with John Connor threatening, well, you know, ends with the Terminator threatening to kill John Connor or exterminating the master or pick, you know, pick your sci-fi moment. It doesn't end well, usually. The robots come alive and the first thing they decide to do is kill us. Um, that's where autonomy tends to end up in the imagination. And then the reality is, technically, there are multiple instantiations of this going on. If you were to look at what Google is doing with autonomous vehicles, they've instrumented it completely differently than Tesla, they've instrumented it completely differently than Volvo, who are building it completely differently than Uber. They all call them autonomous vehicles. The technologies that sit underneath of them are completely different. With Tesla, they are a, basically a single-headed point where every object communicates back. This object up here decides what it will send out again to all the individual nodes on the network who are then updated. Each one of those nodes operates autonomously, except not really, because they're all going to be overridden by the whole. Volvo's autonomous vehicle fleet is a flat structure. They communicate in an ad hoc network to each other without reference to an overarching whole. Uber and Google sit somewhere in between, but none of those things are necessarily the same as saying autonomy in both the philosophical sense and the cultural sense. And irregardless of what we meant by it, there are really interesting questions about do we need to get to a shared understanding of it? Do we need to get to 
a standardized technical build out of it, because frankly, how we regulate it is determined by that. If multiple people are using the word autonomous and building different things underneath of them, how you regulate that gets a little tricky. There are incredibly complicated questions about how you secure it, which turn out to be paramount. The notion of objects that are acting without reference to pre-written rules suggests some really interesting questions about safety and about security. And also, frankly, from the human side, there are two other questions, right? About what will it mean to live in a world where objects act without reference to us? And then how will we know they're doing it and do we need to care? So in Australia, at least, when you have young drivers, you know they're autonomous, but you don't entirely trust them. That's why they get learner's permits and L points. And in Australia, P plates, because they're provisional drivers for a year after that, where you sort of go, yeah, don't get near them when they're parallel parking. Also, not after dark. We know how to signal autonomous, but not entirely good. Think about the pushback that came when Google released its most recent set of technologies at their um, conference four weeks ago now, where they had AI objects that were making telephone calls uh, masquerading as humans. The pushback from humans was really bad when we realized that they were technical objects masquerading as humans. So there is a question there about what do we signal to whom and how? And then how do those objects move across national boundaries? Because I'm willing to bet as another country that has lived through the colonial encounter more than once, you might be a little concerned about what it would mean to have technical objects that had someone else's notion of autonomy in them on your soil. Which gets me to the second set of questions, which is about what does it mean to think about the nature of agency? A social science term here, but imagine we might mean this as limits or controls. So if an object can act without reference to a pre-written rule set, some version of autonomous action, what are the limits on that action? And how are they imposed, made sense of, and determined? So let's pick the autonomous vehicle again, all right? Okay. Here, so it's allowed to act autonomously. Does it have to stop on the border? And if so, which border? And determined <laughs> by whom and under which circumstances? And what would you have it do differently when it went to Northern Ireland versus here? Does your car then have to be updated because of Brexit? And if so, how would you do that? <laughs> I know it's easy to laugh about that, but imagine these are rule sets that are going to govern how these vehicles are autonomous. Who determines the rules? How are they litigated in both the legal sense but also in the cultural sense? Do those rules sit on the object or somewhere external to the object? In Australia, if we were to talk about autonomous vehicles, one of the great concerns is that uh, Removing vehicles from the road when they are in the path of emergency vehicles is a big deal. So getting out of the way of ambulances and in particular fire trucks in Australia turns out to be a critical game changer because of the way bushfires work in Australia. You could have an override that sat at the network level that ensured there were never an emergency vehicle needed to go through all autonomous vehicles were automatically pulled off the road. It doesn't need to sit at the vehicle level, it can sit at the network level. But who gets to determine that? How does that get vetted and enacted? How would you imagine an override system? Who determined it? Who got to utilize it? What are the rules? Are they visible? What does it mean when you have multiple objects with different rule sets having to engage each other? Autonomous vehicles and a smart transportation system. Do the vehicles talk to the traffic lights or are those two things completely separate from one another yet operating in the same controlled space? How do we then think about those objects as they move again across national boundaries? We know how to think about localization. Historically, when those things came to Australia, that meant we changed the Zs to Ss. We went from 120 to 240 volts. We did a few other things, you know, move the steering wheel. Um, but what does it mean to think about completely different rule sets? And what does it mean to think about those rule sets when we know that the people who build those rule sets don't always have everyone in mind, because some of those rule sets are built in commercial companies, not government enterprises. Some of them are built for consumers, not citizens. Many of them are built for certain kinds of citizens, not others. <coughs> How do we imagine all of that? And what would it mean to give objects and systems limited forms of agency? When would you review it? Who would scrutinize it? Who would those people be? And again, how would you signal it? And frankly, what will it feel like to be human in a world where a whole lot of decisions are being made around us and aren't necessarily surfaced to us? 
and may not always have us in mind. I mean, we often talk about the fear of the machines displacing us. I think the interesting question here is what happens if what they displace isn't just our work but our judgment and our senses of what it is that we bring that is valuable to the equation. Which leads neatly to the third set of questions, which are about what I keep calling assurance, but which I suspect has sitting under it a whole series of other words. Safety, security, risk, trust, liability, explicability, manageability. What will it mean to think about systems that are operating autonomously? How do we think about liability there? How do we think about risk? How do we think about safety for whom and under what circumstances? So the German government released one of the first global sort of white papers basically about how you might regulate a world of autonomous vehicles. They did it last summer, so about a year ago. The first thing they did was attempt to articulate who was liable for damages and risk. And they suggested tripartite structure. So the manufacturers of the vehicles are on the hook for the damage the vehicles do. But in order for the vehicles to be cleared to be on the roads, they have to do less danger to pedestrians than current vehicles do. What's interesting about that is it's not the drivers that are the safety object, but pedestrians, which suggests these are already understood as things that are societal objects, not individual objects. So that's already an interesting first stake in the ground. Second piece they say is that the state and governments in Germany are responsible for creating a clear and well-marked road structure. Because of course the thing about autonomous vehicles is they're not really autonomous, they need roads, and the roads need signs, and the signs need to be consistent from state to state, or it gets complicated for the vehicles. It also means someone has to be responsible for doing all of that. This is usually how the thing falls over in Australia, because the notion that we will have well-signed roads given the size of my country is almost impossible. We have things that are memories of roads, and some vague sense of signage, so we have other problems. But state, signs and roads. Federal government is then on the hook in this particular set of standards for creating a shared and easily promulgated rule set that everyone can agree to. Yeah, exactly, that everyone can agree to. That's complicated because that, of course, means the rule set needs to be everything that's explicit and nothing that's tacit. And so thinking about these systems works when the rules are explicit and non-contested. It doesn't work when there is ambiguity in the rules and stuff that is tacit. So any ways of getting around that aren't written down, which would basically be every way I've ever seen someone be a pedestrian in Dublin, for instance. <laughs> Irregardless of the sign that unhelpfully says, watch for the green man, you apparently watch it and then ignore it. <laughs> Now imagine you have an entire infrastructure full of cars that are obeying the rules and humans that are not. And that would be the difference between explicit and tacit. And how you think about building a system against those makes it really hard to think about how you do safety. Because actually the biggest problem in most of these systems is the human piece of the problem, but we are in fact all here. So thinking about how you design with us, not around us, is a huge piece of it. And then frankly, the EU is leading the way around notions of explicability. The GDPR legislation that came into effect last month well, now two months ago, has a really interesting call out about the right to explanation, which is actually a huge challenge in this space. Most algorithms, particularly anything that relies on deep learning or machine learning in the unsupervised space, has a very hard time explaining how it got to the answer and an even harder time reproducing it. So what it means to think about how these systems will explain what they are doing in a manner that is transparent to citizens, regulatory bodies, and whomever else is actually a really interesting piece of the puzzle, given that many of these systems are likely to operate inside tightly controlled and regulated spaces. So think medicine, the law, finances, and the military. So those are all big questions. And then there are two more questions which I think are actually equally important and differently complicated to address. One of them is about metrics. So. The Industrial Revolution thus far has proceeded on the notion that the appropriate metric was an increase in productivity or efficiency. So machines did what humans couldn't, faster, without lunch breaks, <laughs> relentlessly, uh, often with only the efficiency as the appropriate metric. And we know all kinds of things that I think were we to do it over again, we might think differently about. One of them is certainly about environmental sustainability. We might have approached the first wave of the Industrial Revolution differently if we had realized that we would still be living with the consequences 200 years later. But what are the metrics here, right? If you imagine cyber-physical systems, and we're talking about everything from cars to elevators to transportation systems to things you might ingest, is the right metric productivity and efficiency? The car companies will all tell you that it's about safety. 
my colleagues who look on things using artificial intelligence and strategy inside of other objects would tell you it's about a better quality of decisions, would tell you it's about different collections of data. I was talking to a research scientist the other day who's interested in cyber physical systems because as he puts it, for the last 30 years their data collection method has been throwing people consensually, I might add, off the back of boats with a camera and asking them to put their head above water every two minutes. Which means you can only do that in fair weather and daytime. So they have a data problem. And so they really like the idea of cyber physical systems because they don't want lunch and you can throw them off the boat whenever you want. That's not about efficiency and productivity, right? It's about something completely different. What I also know, and Leonard knows this too, from our time in, in Intel, is that what you measure is what you make. And so imagining that we put our metrics up at the front would be a really interesting way of thinking about this. One of the things they rarely tell you about certain forms of artificial intelligence and the techniques that sit underneath of it, in particular deep learning, but actually all of it, is that it's incredibly energy intensive. At this moment in time, upwards of 10% of the world's, the world's, 10% of the world's energy budget is spent on server farms. That's a lot, by the way I think about it. Like 10% seems like a big number, big enough that we can measure it. Imagining that you are now going to have systems that will consume more energy. I know the argument is always, well, you know, energy efficiencies come over time. Sure, but we're talking about an increasing density of technology, so each individual object may get more energy efficient, but we're talking about a whole lot more of them. The gain at some point there may be a wash in terms of energy efficiency, but what if one of the metrics we set in place was actually there are some times when using a human is more efficient than using a piece of technology because the energy burden is less. Or what if we said these objects actually need to be energy efficient? What would that look like? How would we think about cyber physical systems where the key metric was sustainability? And we built that in from the beginning. Or, in the Australian instance, what if we had to imagine from day one that what it means to be a colonial country means that the original inhabitants still live there and they have a completely different idea about data and about autonomous objects? An issue that we're already seeing play out in New Zealand and Canada with indigenous <coughs> ideas about data sovereignty and data ownership might mean these systems proceed completely differently. So how you imagine what the metrics are there, when the metrics are about cultural sensitivities and energy efficiencies, might be completely different than productivities. But what I know is that you could have a conversation about it now and end up with a different set of solutions or questions than we've seen before. And then last but by no means least, there is always this question, which is that I spent 20 years in Silicon Valley and my field was often called human-computer interactions. The thing about an interaction is it's not the same as an engagement or a relationship. And an interaction is possible when the interface to the technology is thin and singular. <laughs> Keyboard, glass, a stack of programming cards. It's something completely different if what you imagine these are objects that you will live in, be moved around by, that may live in you, <laughs> that may live around you and not care about you at all. And what the nature is of the way we choose to engage with those objects feels profoundly different than what HCI has gotten us up until this moment in time. And so for me, thinking about how it is as humans we want to engage and not engage with these objects, and how we want to engage with each other, and with our existing and newly created social institutions is a really interesting question. And what it means to think about those not as reproducing the last 60 years of HCI, or frankly, the 20 years before that of experiments that got us to fly by wire. I don't want to think about, you know, well, the Apollo project, and how it is that we learnt to fly planes when planes could do things humans couldn't, which was not a good look for the American Air Force. And I don't think we could stand it now, but what it means to think about the nature of the human in all of this, both in terms of how we do and don't engage with these systems and engage with each other in a world of those systems, for me is about how we get beyond thinking about the kind of classic HCI paradigm and start thinking about something else. What would it mean to re re rewrite this, right? What would it mean to think about these as systems that were, I don't know, nurturing, caring, the robots that didn't want to kill us but wanted to look after us? It might be a different paradigm. But also thinking about how those systems function and what their relationships are to each other, rather than imagining that it is all an interaction and contestation is, for me at least, how you might think about those things. So, lots of things I don't know. I don't know what the discipline is called. I don't precisely know when it has to be done by. You know, history would tell us we've got a while. History is good for 
giving you better questions. I don't think it's good for getting you answers. I think the reality is you need to start all of this sooner rather than later, hence my great desire to test a curriculum in 2019. What I know is that these are at least the first ways of thinking about how you get to questions. I don't think they get us to answers, but I think they get us to questions. And if there's one thing being a social scientist in a company of engineers has taught me, and being a social scientist in Silicon Valley, is that she who asks the best questions ultimately makes more interesting conversations and will make a difference. So I think there is something about the power of framing a question that's as important as getting to the answer. And so I don't know what the discipline is. I don't quite know when it appears. I'm not even convinced these are the only questions, but they're the best ones I have right now. And for me, at least, they start as profoundly human questions. And so whatever it means to be human in the 21st century, for me, has to start by asking questions of the systems around us and questions that are located in our own lived experiences, our own cultures, and I think importantly for me as a good card-carrying feminist, our own bodies and our embodied and lived experiences because I think all of those things matter. And so with that, I'm going to actually draw breath, drink my water, and say thank you. Thank you.